long and a retreat here. And uh, I would like to pick up the theme for that day long as the topic for this morning. And, um, and as I started the talk yesterday, I'll start it this way with an analogy. Uh, I've lived uh, here on the peninsula now for about 25 years. And a good amount of time, about seven years up in the mountains up here, on the top of Skyline, uh, in the woods. And I've lived with my wife, who is a botanist. And she worked professionally in those mountains uh, uh, as a botanist doing plant surveys. So she knows these plants very well. And we've done a lot of hiking together and alone in these mountains and hills. And I love it and love the nature here. And amazingly enough, um, especially living with a botanist, I haven't really learned the plants of these hills for most of that time. And uh, it was kind of like just a blur of plants. <laughs> you know, there, I mean, I knew there were trees and I knew there were bushes and I knew there were little, you know, flowers. And, and I did learn what uh, some of the invasive weeds were, French broom and thistles. And, and I knew a little bit, but you know, I didn't really know much. And uh, I was quite content, you know, it was just, I love being in nature and being out there, but I didn't know. And then about a month ago, uh, she's back for a little while from her big hike that she's doing. And, um, and she, uh, we, was, we were going in regularly up to the walking in the hills, and I started to ask her about the plants. And I found myself quite interested in them, and um, kind of amazed that it took this long. <laughs> and, um, and was quite struck by the difference between um, how it used to be, which I was quite content, and what it's like now. And uh, so I'm still learning, there's a lot to learn, boy. But um, uh, you know, I can, now I can identify the predominant trees, the different kinds of oaks. And I can identify uh, you know, some of the chaparral and the bushes and some of the you know, plants and flowers. And, and, um, and as, uh, you know, some of the trees now I can identify by their bark. I don't have to even look up at the canopy. <clears throat> because the bark is distinctive. And, and, um, and as I'm learning more and more about them, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm also getting curious about, well, what uses do these have? And so I'm reading a little bit about the Native American uses and the early uh, Spanish settlers and, what they, and the, what they, how they used the different plants and what they did and with them. And, and I find it fascinating. And, uh, and now when I go into the woods up here, I find my, my attention is heightened. And I'm much less likely to contentedly drift off and think about things as I'm walking. Now I'm uh, very attentive and just love kind of noticing what's around me and noticing the different plants and different things. And, and um, things stand out and highlight and I notice things about the vegetation, about the local little climate zones and how things shift and change. and, and um, and you know the worlds come kind of alive in a very different way, and I have a kind of delightful heightened attention to my environment as I walk now, and find myself increasingly curious about what's around me, and so that's nice. Well, the same thing can happen uh, with our minds in meditation, and uh, I think some meditators can spend 25 years; it's all a blur in there. <laughs> And, um, and they have generally know a little bit about it. We know a little bit about the invasive weeds, you know, the distractive thoughts that come in. And, you know, we know that we should pull them out and, and not get caught up in them and let go of them, come back to the present moment. And, um, and that's helpful when we calm down. And in the blur of just going for our meditative hike in our minds, um, you know, it's all kind of just nice. It's, you know, a blur of things in there. Uh, but we know some of the highlights, you know, we know that we're getting calmer or more steady or, you know, some, some general sense of what it's about. It's also possible to uh, become cognizant, to be able to identify uh, the different species in there, the different elements 
of the mind, the qualities of mind, and be able to kind of, you know, and we have an amazingly rich, uh, complex inner life that is probably, in terms of the highlights of what you really need to know, a lot fewer things than going up to one of these nature preserves here. One of the books that we have for the plants on one of the preserves has 400 plants. So if you want to learn all the plants, that's a lot to learn. I'm kind of a little bit intimidated by it. But to learn your mind, luckily you don't have to learn 500 items. Uh, there's actually a few, it's a simpler ecosystem, believe it or not. Uh, but it is possible to learn more about what's going on in there and the different elements, what comes into play. And if you do that as you meditate, the meditation becomes richer. There's, uh, things, things become more noticeable. You're more engaged. You're more involved with uh, yourself in meditation and it becomes more interesting because it's not just simply, I'm either calm or not calm or something. I'm either distracted or not distracted. And it becomes uh, uh, kind of a, uh, in a very appealing inner world to get to know and explore. And I think of it as an ecosystem. I think it, you know, our inner life is, as mu- is just as much part of the natural world as being out and walking in the preserves. And if you want to kind of be in awe or be inspired by nature, uh, take a walk in your mind. Take a walk in your inner life and get to know it and know what's going on there. So uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to highlight about what we can get to know and that helps meditation is to know uh, the different kinds of attention. Uh, So maybe almost like there's different species of attention. And uh, different ones are useful in different vegetation zones, little microclimates, meaning that in different circumstances we find ourselves in, different forms of attention are useful. In different um, uh, situations of inner climates of our mind, different attentions are useful. Uh, And we know that little bit, I think, well enough, if you think about it, that, um, uh, you know, if you are maybe at the beach and just kind of, you know, just relaxed on the sand dunes and just kind of looking out across the ocean, uh, it's a very different kind of attention being used than um, if you're at the grocery store and they've given you your receipt and you want to check and you think something's wrong, (laughs) you know, if how much they're charging you, you know, and use a very different kind of attention you know, to look at those numbers and figure it out and, you know, like, it's very focused and attentive. It's not like, oh, oh, look at these numbers. (laughs) Wow, you know, and numbers, human beings have had numbers for a while, they do wonderful things, and this is so inspiring that the grocery stores, they use these wonderful tools, numbers, wow. (laughs) It's like, you know, it's a laser focus, you know, very attentive and for a purpose. Different situations, we use different kinds of attention, awareness, and um, and so sometimes, so the, in meditation, the same thing. Um, and so, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the uh, main forms of attention that come into play when we meditate, with the idea that maybe you'll recognize these in yourselves, and as you start recognizing them your own self, then uh, they become more something that you can choose to use as it's needed, uh, as opposed to one shoe fits all kind of approach to meditation. There's only one kind of attention, this is what you do. Sometimes you have, uh, people have the idea that, um, that, that concentrated attention, that's what you're supposed to do, just keep concentrating. And, um, and they have a very small, narrow idea of what concentration is, as opposed to that it's uh, maybe a variety of different factors that are brought together. Um, some people have the idea that it's only about noting. It's only about recognizing what's there. And that's all you're supposed to, all you're allowed to do is recognize. And I've known people, maybe because their inner life was so challenged, who have uh, used a technique of mental noting like a lifesaver. They're holding on to it for dear life because any giving up of that means that there's difficult inner life uh, bubbles up and just makes life too chaotic or difficult. And so there's hanging on, and it's not really meditative attention. It's just like, you know, just keep, uh, keep noting everything that's going on, making a note, and it's just keeping everything at bay. And I've known people who, um, who uh, practice uh, 
who don't want to do any kind of directed attention. They don't want to do any kind of effort in it. They like things being effortless and relaxed and open and spacious. And um, maybe because their mind is usually the opposite, and so this is a relief. But sometimes, uh, if that's all they do, there's not really learning what's in there. It's not really clear recognition. And some people drift off, sometimes for years, into some kind of, I don't know if stupor is the right word, but some kind of vague place. Uh, I've known people who have spent, uh, I think someone recently said 25 years, um, in meditation regularly, and uh, going into a, sp- a, sp- a very uh, peaceful, spacious place where there was nothing there. And uh, to spend 25 years in nothing, uh, you know, no body, no world around them, kind of into kind of a blank place, uh, is probably is not very useful. Uh, there's probably not a lot of wisdom and learning that goes in that, spa- in that place, but it, it can be a welcome relief from the challenges of daily life. And some people go into those spaces sometimes because of the tremendous difficulty they've had in their lives, and they're really looking not to have to deal with that, and so they're looking for something that checks out or something. So there, uh, there's a season for everything, and, uh, and so there's a season, I think, for every type of meditation state, and and uh, different ways of using attention. And, uh, but I think it's a, a wise thing to start learning the different options and different ways that things can work and know when it's needed. So one of the, uh, so if, 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 if we're kind of getting too used to or getting wise about the inner landscape that comes in, into play when we meditate, uh, you know, if you, uh, you want to be able to notice the important landmarks that are there. And with the landmarks in mind, you can kind of begin following your way. And probably for most meditators, who are especially people in the beginning, uh, one of the primary landmarks is to notice um, the particular species of thinking, which is distracted thought, that you're lost in thought. And uh, some people come to meditation and have never a clue that they've ever been distracted ever in their life. <laughs> They've never been lost in thought because they're just so lost that, you know, <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> and, um, and it's a bit of a shock for some beginning meditators to see how diff- crazy it is in there or how distracted they are, caught up and the momentum, strong current of being caught up, how that works. That's actually a very important landscape. It's like, like you know, you notice a very important part of the terrain that you're exploring it and knowing it. If you go up in these preserves, especially this year, um, I think one of the really important things to recognize, more than probably for most of us, not all of you probably, but for most people, is to know to recognize poison oak. <laughs> it's, it's like exploded this year. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I've been a poison oak expert. Because my wife gets poison oak very, very badly. So I've been an expert in our hikes to point it out to her. Watch out, it's there. And this year, it's like hanging down above. I'm looking down at the, I'm looking down at the ground, and it's hanging from above. It hits you in the face. And, and it's just like, it's like, you know, you have to, you know, it's, it's, like, it's, it's like there to trap us. It's reaching out from <laughs> to get us. So, so, you know, it's good to know about the poison oak. It's good to know about these, uh, this phenomenon of distracted thought, getting lost in thought. Uh, because that's like going into the bushes where the poison oak is. Uh, you know, it's too easy to get caught and get caught up in places which not sometimes not very ideal and useful for us or healthy for us to go into some of these places. And so to learn to recognize that and be cognizant of it, and one of the things we notice is these distracted thoughts. Sometimes it's not just that we're, we're distracted, but there's a lot of momentum there's a strong gravitational pull or there's a strong drive in the mind to want to go there. And um, it's not just so. That's why it's difficult just to let go because we let go and the drive to think is still there. The emotional pull, push for it is there. And so uh, something is needed to correct for that if we want to be present and not in that world. And, uh, And there's two primary things that are useful. One is, uh, if it's possible to relax, that momentum to keep thinking. So I often teach about relaxing the thinking muscle. So relax something, sometimes just relaxing physically, mentally, 
emotionally, um, there's less power in that distracted thought. The other is to uh, counter it with a counterforce. And the counterforce is to use directed attention. And to have the attention be directed to something that's not distracted thinking. The, the most classic thing I think in Buddhist meditation is to direct the attention to breathing. It could be directing, the, there are other things as well, directing it to doing loving kindness, directing it to do other forms of meditation, uh, focuses. But uh, uh, as an act of choice, as an act of will, uh, to direct the attention to something that's considered healthy or skillful, and as we do that, like stay on the breath, slowly the distracted attention, uh, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're strengthening that capacity to stay present, we're strengthening capacity to have directed attention, um, and we're weakening slowly, bit by bit, the, the energy of distraction. Because every time you bring your attention back, it's the food of attention is going to feed that ability to have directed attention. Every time that you don't do that, you're feeding, attention is feeding distracted thoughts. So slowly you begin feeding one more than the other, strengthening one more than the other. And there's, there can be a, a shift. Sometimes that shift happens in a single uh, state of, uh, uh, session of meditation. Sometimes that state you know, shifts and changes over a period of time or years of meditation. And people slowly begin to get have the ability to stay more directed and stay present for the attention. And direct attention can take itself a number of different forms. And um, so if directed attention is the genus, then the species is different forms of directed attention. Uh, one of them uh, is uh, attention that simply knows what's happening. So you're there and you kind of know in some simple way, that's the breathing, I'm with the in-breath, that's the out-breath, and we know it. And, uh, and so there's an, uh, there can be, that knowing can be both active and and passive. Um, we can engage, we can direct the attention, and we can in, uh, heighten that directedness by getting to know what's there, recognizing what's there. And so first it's kind of very, make, very simple knowing, but there can be a heightened knowing. And that heightened knowing uh, in Pali is sampajana, clear comprehension, or I like the expression clear recognition. And this is a phenomenal capacity of the mind to not just kind of know what's going on, but clearly know what's going on. This is an in-breath, or this is a distracted thought. This is a you know, particular emotion. This is sadness. This is joy. But to really, really kind of you know, be very clear about the recognition. So when I'm walking up in the hills these days, before, I could recognize it was a tree. I'm not that lost. Um, but now I clearly recognize, uh, you know, I was walking down here this morning and some of these local native trees are on the, you know, street trees. And, um, and uh, I'm kind of in awe at this last couple of weeks with the black oaks. And when I was walking down the street, I said, oh, there's a black oak. I didn't know it was there. And that was pretty cool. And I rec clearly recognized it. Uh, now that I'm paying attention, the other day, about a week or two ago, um, I said, I walked by a tree that I've walked by for 20 years, <laughs> 25, you know, a long time. Not 20 years, but I've been walking by for about 17 years. And, um, and I walked by, I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wow, this is a Dawn Redwood. Do you know about Dawn Redwoods? No? That's a really cool story. Can we do a little aside? <laughs> and uh, because it has a Buddhist association, this Dawn Redwood. Uh, it was a redwood that was thought to be extinct. In the 1940s, Chinese botanists found a few of them in deep in the mountains in, in China 
And, uh, and the way I was told the story, the way it was preserved down through the centuries was in uh, Buddhist monasteries. Because I guess the trees are not, not so uncommon for places to be deforested, but the Buddhist monasteries, the trees are kept there. And so at a Buddhist monastery, they found this dawn redwood. It's a deciduous redwood. It doesn't grow that high. And, uh, and so then in the late 40s, early 50s, it was brought to the United States and then dissipated, dissipated dis- disseminated the seeds, I guess, in different places. And, and uh, I first learned about it from a Native American uh, uh, who uh, kind of elder chieftain uh, up in Marin County uh, who had been a botanist himself at UC Berkeley in the 50s. And he was one of the first people to get a little seedling or seed, and he planted it... Um, near Muir Woods, and so he took me to the tree and showed me the tree, and that was pretty cool. And um, so there it is, right here. You'll, uh, if, you, if you come to the picnic, <laughs> if you come to the picnic, I'll show it to you. How's that an incentive to have you come? It's in the park, there. And um, so, uh, so, this cl- so I clearly recognize this. And there's like, aha, there's this wonderful moment. Ah, I know this black oak, the dawn redwood. So we have the capacity in the mind to watch what's going on in ourselves. So, oh, this is what it is. Wow, I'm angry. <laughs> now, that might not seem like a big deal. But clear recognition um, is a dis- very distinct from entangled recognition. Entangled recognition goes something like this. I'm aware that my body is uncomfortable in meditating. Yes, I recognize I'm uncomfortable. But I recognize it like this. Oh, it's so uncomfortable. Well, why am I meditating today? And why am I meditating at all? It's so uncomfortable. And, you know, and here, you know, probably I didn't do enough exercise. And I didn't do enough exercise because my parents didn't encourage me much enough to exercise when I was a kid and these parents that I have and you know I really didn't grow up well and you know you know this I guess this discomfort is like just their fault <laughs> you know I'm entangled I recognize but I'm completely lost in a story and meaning and associations and all that and unfortunately and that's kind of a dramatic story but it can be much more subtle that entanglement that involvement it could be as simple as I'm uncomfortable it's my discomfort. You know, it's not yours, right? But it's not an innocent thing to call it my discomfort. It, uh, uh, it's, if you really get st- still and quiet, you can feel the difference between um, just feeling it as discomfort versus my discomfort. So there's kind of entangled with this me, myself, and mine. But to clearly know the simplicity of it wow, this is discomfort. There's a way in which that recognition is not entangled. It's kind of like you step back enough and you say, wow, I see it for what it is. And one way to get to that is you want to experiment with it. Next time you get uh, entangled in your mind with your favorite entanglement, or your mind's favorite entanglement, um, start uh, using mental noting to start recognizing it. So, like, maybe it's distracted thought, distracted thinking. That does, just doing it that way doesn't do enough. You're still entangled with it. This is distracted thinking. Distracted thinking. And just kind of do it emphatically until the emphatic way of saying distracted recognition is not, is clearly distinct from what's being recognized. It's like you really step back and there's a place in the mind that really recognizes it, which is not the same thing, or not entangled with what's being recognized. So that's a little exercise that points to what's possible. That clear recognition, and when it's really done well, uh, there's a kind of freedom in it. There's an independence from what is known. So one of the things we're looking for, one of the capacities we have in using attention is attention that includes recognition. And that recognition can be very simple or it can be very clear and powerful, the clear recognition. And to engage clear recognition 
it helps to be specific about what we notice in the mind. If it's all a blur, it's hard to have the kind of specificity of recognizing a black oak or a dawn redwood or whatever it might be. And um, so that's one kind of way of using attention. And that works very well sometimes if it's chaotic in here or if we're very distracted as a counter to all that. It also works very well in order to start seeing more clearly and not being entangled with things or reactive to things. But, you know, that's good. But then there are other forms of attention. And, um, and another one that the Buddha talks about is observing, anapasati, to observe, to look. And, um, and look has, a, uh, uh, the way I understand it, has a, a much, a much more easily to be both an active and a passive thing to do. We can look very clear, you know, it's kind of close to clear recognition, but the focus now is not so much, maybe you already recognize what's there, and it's very clear what's there, but to look is to actively look more closely. And actually, what's really going on here? What's the nature of this thing that's going on? And so maybe you're looking at the Dawn Redwood, and you, st- you as I did when I first got there, I wasn't sure, is this really Dawn Redwood? And so I started looking more carefully at the leaves and at the bark and what was going on there until I convinced my, and there was little, you know, seeds growing there and I, until I kind of convinced, my, convinced myself this is it. So we can look. So even if something like breathing, you can be clear that you're breathing, but to really look closely. And that looking closely can be a microscopic look. Really look closely at the where the breathing is most highlighted in it. Really look at the microscopic details of the sensations that come into play as you're breathing. And this is what we were expected to do when I was did Vipassana in Burma, is to have a kind of a microscopic view on the experience. Other times, it's more, much more useful to look in a very passive and receptive way and have a kind of a macro lens. And we have, attention can be micro or macro. And there, to some degree, we can choose that. And sometimes you want to have a macro lens and not, you know, be boring in and having, a, you know, in close up, but take the wide angle lens and just kind of take in the whole scenery. Up in the local park here, there's a bench. You walk up and I'm looking at all the trees and everything plants now. And then I come to this bench that's kind of high up that overlooks the plain and the, the meadow and the trees. And I stop doing this fine detail looking then. At the, then I'm just kind of, you know, it's just beautiful to relax and settle back and take in the sky and the bay and the trees and the meadow that's there. And it's quite lovely. So that we have this, uh, we have a capacity for a kind of attention that's wide angled. And a, an observation which is not so active, looking carefully at something, but it's more just receptive. And it can be delicious to have this receptive mode and just allow things to be there and come and go as they do, provided that the mind is stable enough. Uh, because uh, it has to be, uh, the forces of distraction have to be lessened. So, because otherwise, as soon as we go into kind of more of a passive receptive mode, the mind zips off into its preoccupation. And so, uh, sometimes we're using a form of attention that helps us get centered, helps us get less distracted, helps us to be in the present moment enough. And then some, we have more choice, and one of the choices then is to relax and open up. Uh, generally, it's people who've meditated for a long time who uh, have a greater and greater capacity for a non-directed attention, a uh, receptive attention, a macro attention that can be quite lovely to practice with. And, that has its advantages because um, sometimes that can highlight um, all the ways in which we leave that. We get all the ways we get contracted. It can also sometimes make a lot of space and room in the mind and the heart for uh, the movement of different forms of understanding, different forms of processing, for the unfolding and resolving of things in our life from the inside out. Our system can do it because it has a lot of space a lot of room. We have breathing room for things to begin happening. 
So this observing can be close in, a close up, really take it in closely and see it. It could be a little bit further away and it can be really far away. And that can be really useful to know you have that options when things are really difficult. Some things, uh, do, uh, meditation works best for some situations to be close up and sometimes what works best is to back up really far. Uh, fear is one of those where some people find if there's a lot of terror and fear when they sit down to meditate, being close up in the middle of fear is not useful. It kind of just kind of triggers even more of it. And so sometimes people who have a lot of fear in meditation learn to kind of step back and use their awareness to kind of lean back and almost as if their, their awareness is two blocks away. And, uh, and that distance, kind of looking at it, uh, and then it's safe to be with the fear, but to close in doesn't work. And so the different forms of attention can include this close up and this far away. You know, wh- 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 where, where's the best place to be? The best to be really precise. I find sometimes with uh, discomfort, I find it useful to be right close up, really right in the heart of where it's most uncomfortable. Uh, sometimes with emotions, I find it useful to kind of be very broad and macro and just open to them. Different things, different things, different ways of being at different times. And, um, and then what's interesting uh, in terms of different kinds of awareness is uh, the most famous awareness for our scene is mindfulness. And, uh, but I think the word mindfulness, I don't really know what mindfulness is even though I'm a mindfulness teacher. Um, but I think that when I read the teachings of the Buddha, that the, the word that we translate as mindfulness, which is sati, is a much better to translate into English as awareness. And, uh, and awareness, distinct from different forms of attention, uh, is awareness is the underlying basic, natural, kind of automatic capacity to be aware. It, it doesn't require attention, it doesn't require effort, it doesn't require choice and decision. Uh, the mind somehow will naturally be aware uh, without you, you know, trying to do so. In fact, if, uh, you know, if you're listening to me and I tell you, I, I insist that you have to stop being aware, just cut it out. This is nonsense. You know, it's kind of hard to stop being aware. You know, it's just, that's what the mind will do. And, uh, and so, uh, and so, when the Buddha talks about mindfulness, he never actually talks about it as something that we do. Oddly enough, given the here in America, we talked about you know, practicing mindfulness. It's never something that's done, but rather it's something people rest in. It's people abide in, in in awareness. And so, the ability to abide in awareness. Takes a lo- to get there, it takes a lot of self-understanding. You have to know the inner landscape. You have to know how not to get distracted. You have to know, learn how to establish a kind of centered attention, focused attention to be really here in the present moment. And then when you're really rooted in the present, then uh, you can kind of rest in an open, relaxed awareness. And the advantage of that is that uh, to rest in this uh, unself-conscious awareness, an awareness that we're not directing or doing or that we're not the self, is not an agent for it, it would really rest and be in that awareness. That sets the stage for, um, it's kind of like we've cleared the room from all the, um, I don't know if that's the right analogy, but we've kind of uh, loosened all the ropes that keep us entangled. And so as they're loosened and loosened and loosened, then uh, they can just, the knots can just unravel. And, uh, but as soon as we are the agent, the one who's trying to do something, trying to accomplish something, some of those knots get tighter. And so one of the definitions that I like for what is the self, some people are like, what's the self? Buddhism says there's not supposed to be a self. What's the self? One definition I like is, the self is a knot. And you can live with that knot or you can untie it. 
And so as, these, as we rest in awareness, then these knots begin to un- disentangle. And as they're loose enough, then at some point the knots the, can just slip away from each other. And the strings can be free. So there's directed attention and there's undirected attention. There is a, attention that involves recognition, knowing, and, and attention that involves clear recognition. There's a kind of attention that, that's more observing, watching, that can be close in or be far away. That can be um, uh, uh, passive and just kind of receptive, or it can be also active, kind of really directing the microscope to look someplace. And then there's a tension that we, uh, that we have that is natural, a natural functioning of the mind, that if we have all the conditions have come together right, then it's something that we can rest in. And it really feel, feels like we're resting or abiding in the sense of clarity and openness and just real presence that's there. And mostly what we need to do is to uh, not mess it up. Uh, mostly what we do then is not make ourselves aware, but mostly we recognize when we start getting pulled into thought, we let go of it. So it's mostly letting go back into it, letting go back into it, is if anything is needed. Because any attempt to do it is just uh, tying more knots. So there's more, to, more many more forms of awareness, but uh, what I, one of the things I wanted to convey today is, um, or try to pass on to you, uh, is that you get interested in what do you do? Maybe rather than trying to learn what I taught today and then try to find out if you do it or start doing these things, um, take a good look. You, chances are high that a good number of you have been, as meditators, have been you know, taking that wonderful walk in the, in the mental, mental park. And it's kind of been a blur, all the things in there. Start looking, and uh, what, what, are you, what are you doing when you're paying attention? How do you engage your attention? And what are the different forms of attention you use in the course of the day? Do you use a different form of attention when you're doing your taxes than when you're driving? Do you use a different form of attention when you are... Um, going for a walk in the park or at the seashore or something from when you're making love. What kind of, what are the different forms of attention that are operating for you and, and how are they operating and, and, uh, and do you have, as you see the variety of different ways that knowing, attention, awareness, recognition are operating, what are you, you know, what are you learning and what are you doing there? And, um, I wanted to stop, but then I remembered one of the really important forms of knowing and awareness that I wanted to mention. And one of the ones that I think is really very important, I think, for uh, this whole mindfulness or meditation. Because the kinds of attention I was talking about now are all kind of mental. They're kind of in the mind kind of aspects of it. Uh, A whole other way of knowing and being aware is sensing is to sense our experience. We have a lot of knowing or awareness, attention has to do with how we take in a stimulus from the world around us or or within us. How we uh, take in the data that comes in. And so there's a mindfulness of the body where we're tuned into how things are being sensed physically is phenomenally important. Uh, for a variety of different reasons, but one of them is that it takes us out of our head. And there's a lot of information that we acquire about this wonderful natural world of ourselves that's acquired by tuning into what's alive in the body, what's being stimulated, what's being released, what's being expressed in the body. And to sense the body gives us access to a tremendous amount of wisdom and processing. And that's another way of knowing, of being aware is to sense the experience. 
And so I find it very, very useful sometimes to drop into the body and just know things through how they're felt in the body. Nothing more complicated than that. As I get better at it or more centered in my body, then I might bring in the recognition of what's there and the two can operate together. So how much are you sensing your environment? How much are you sensing your, your own body in different circumstances? Is your body a resource? Does your body have any relevance uh, in how you're with another person? I find it very helpful to be really in touch with my body when I'm having very important conversations with other people because uh, that's when I really need to track my emotions, my feelings, my responses, my reactions. And the early warning, the early way I discover that is through what's happening in my body. That's where the intuition kind of comes alive. So many ways of being aware, and there's more. Wow, what do you, what do, you do? That's your homework. <laughs> what's your way? What are the different ways that you have And as you become more conscious of the different ways, does that give you more choice? And do you have ways, can you recognize which form of your attentions are useful at different times? And if you begin learning about yourself, how it works for you this week, if if you can, I'd encourage you to find someone, a friend, an enemy, a total stranger, it doesn't matter, and talk to them about what you're discovering. And, uh, you know, say, like, I'm discovering it's useful to do this here and this there and this kind of awareness and, and see what, uh, you know, if be, you can have some interesting conversations about this very important part of our life. So um, that's probably enough. Um, good. Thank you very much. <laughs>